Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So very much. All righty. So up next, um, we have roll call, Ms. Martinez. Okay. Uh, Mayor Coleman? Here. Councilor Broyles? Yes. Councilor Vigil? Here. Councilor Daniel? Here. Councilor Carson? Here. Councilor Hensley? Here. All councilors present and Councilor Griego previously requested to be excused. Okay. Yes, as I mentioned, mentioned a little earlier, uh, Councilor Griego had a, a family emergency and he wanted to be at the meeting, but uh, unfortunately he's not able to be here tonight. Okay, up next on the agenda, we have the agenda approval. Mayor, I move that we approve the agenda. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Ms. Martinez, will you please take the vote? Yes. Councilor Hensley? I approve. Councilor Carson? I approve. Councilor Daniel? Yes. Councilor Vigil? Yes. Councilor Broyles? Yes. Mayor Coleman? Yes. The motion carried unanimously. Thank you. Up next on the agenda, we have citizen comments. This is the segment of the agenda to where we will allow the uh, citizens to make comments. Uh, we do ask that you keep your comments to a three minute limit. If you are still talking uh, within, after three minutes, I will politely ask you to end uh, your, your, your comments at that particular time. Ms. Martinez, uh, can you please give instructions uh, for those who uh, may be online or either on the cell phone of how to raise their hand so that you can recognize them and we can give them an opportunity to uh, make their comments? Yes, sir. Um, so if you are on the Zoom app, there is a raise your hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you click that, it'll raise your hand. If you're on the telephone and would like to speak, dial star nine and it'll raise your hand for me, for you. So I do have one person uh, with their hand raised. So I have Carlos Lopez. Okay. Hello, can you hear me and see me? We can hear, we hear you. you because okay, I see you. Oh, well, anyway, hello. I'm sorry you can't see me, but um, uh, I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Carlos Lopez. I'm a former city council member here in Trinidad, Colorado, and now I am running for a Democratic State Senate seat for District Number 35. Uh, I have actually worked with um, a couple of your council members, uh, Mayor Pro Tem uh, Liz Hensley, as well as Mr. Charlie Gorego in the Colorado Municipal League aspect, as I was a Colorado Municipal League Executive Board member with uh, Mayor Pro Tem Hensley. And I'm just basically reaching out to introduce myself. I am a uh, rural Democrat who's working really hard to provide innovative trades for our people here in Southern Colorado, because I know we have a lot of issues concerning water depletion and other natural resources that are, uh, well, finite in terms of their capabilities for what they can provide. So I'm looking into new innovative trades that are gonna be lucrative. So we can make sure that our people here can maintain a way of life and also change into a new potential uh, way of making money on their lands without having to sell water rights or you know, move away and not come home. Lastly, I'm very proud to be the founder of the Youth Club of Trinidad. It was my, one of my platform pieces that I ran on in Trinidad and uh, we are running on our fourth year right now, taking care of kids, especially now when it's such a necessity considering how the school districts are up in the air between uh, hybrid systems completely online. There are very few that are actually in full capacity. So we are filling a gap taking care of our young people. Uh, I also want to make sure that we have access to rural broadband and it's enhanced for us because we are just as smart and talented as the rest of the other people on the front range and other more populated areas, but we're just not playing from the same uh, playing field. So I want to level that because we're in a global economy right now. And if people want to be able to telecommute like we're doing right now, 
I want to make sure that they have the capabilities that they're able to do such. Um, rural healthcare is another big issue for us. I would love to say I was born in Trinidad, Colorado, but I wasn't. I had to be born in Raton, New Mexico, because 41 years ago, my mother had to take me over the border to have me. And, and unfortunately, that's still the case. It's sad when people in Trinidad drive up to Pueblo to have a delivery and they have it on the side of the highway. These things are just, they are unconscionable to me. And I feel that we deserve better in rural Colorado. So uh, I just wanted to say thank you. I appreciate your time. Again, my name is Carlos Lopez. I am the Democratic candidate for state Senate in district number 35. I'm a hardworking guy and I got a lot of ideas about how we can protect what we have. Uh, lastly, my, my little catchphrase is uh, preserving our way of life while preparing for the future. I think these are things that we all need to do in order to make sure that we can continue on our way of life. Thank, thank you, you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Okay, Ms. Martinez. Do we have anyone I else? I do not see anybody else. I don't see anyone else with their hand raised. Okay, all righty. Thank you. So now we will now uh, close the citizen comment and I will turn it back over to our city manager uh, for any follow up. There is no staff follow up. Okay, thank you so much. All right, that brings us next to ceremonial items. Um, we have a proclamation, the National Suicide Prevention and Recovery Month Proclamation. Um, as we often try to do, we, we, we try to let the community know that here in Alamosa, we all work together as a team when it comes to city council and, and staff. And tonight um, we have one proclamation and to help me read this proclamation, uh, tonight we have Councillor Daniel who's going to um, help read this proclamation and I'll finish it and she'll start it. Uh, Councillor Daniel. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, so there's theme for National Suicide Prevention and Recovery Month is Be the One to. Uh, so whereas September 2020 is Suicide Prevention and Recovery Month, when millions of people around the world join their voices to share a message of hope and healing. And whereas these observances are united in raising awareness that prevention is possible, treatment is effective, and people do recover. And whereas in these challenging times, messages of hope and healing are more needed than ever. And whereas residents should be able to access high quality prevention, support, rehabilitation, and treatment services that lead to recovery and a healthy lifestyle. And whereas every day in peak People every day, people enter treatment into behavioral health services and community supports and begin the road to wellness and recovery. And whereas resiliency begins early in life within families, daycares, and schools and can be strengthened and reinforced throughout the lifespan. And whereas recovery and wellness encompass the whole individual, including mind, body, spirit, and community. And whereas the benefits of preventing and overcoming mental health challenges, suicide attempts, and laws and substance use are significant and valuable to individuals, families, and other community at large. And whereas it is essential that we educate residents about suicide, mental health, and substance use problems and the ways they affect all people in the community. And whereas we must encourage relatives, friends, coworkers, and providers to recognize the signs of problems and guide those in need to appropriate services and supports. And whereas Suicide Prevention Week and Recovery Month inspires millions of Americans to raise awareness, build resiliency, and find hope. Now, therefore, I, Ty Coleman, Mayor of the City of Alamosa, and on behalf of the City Council, do hereby proclaim the month of September 2020 as Suicide Prevention and Recovery Month. Be the one to ask, keep them safe, be there, help them connect and follow up. Ms. Martinez, do we have anyone here uh, online that would like to make any comments in regards to this proclamation uh, tonight? Uh, yes, sir, we have 
Tamara Valentine, who is going to speak on behalf of the problem. Okay, thank you. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I'm really nervous. <laughs> so you probably hear me breathing heavily too. Um, so yeah, that that was amazing to listen to. Um, my name is Tammy, or Tamara is my real name, but I go by Tammy Valentine. And um, I work for Valley Wide. I live in Romeo. I'm a Valley native, born and raised here. So very familiar with a lot of the cultures and communities that we have here. And um, I've worked in behavioral health for several years and have had a lot of experience in working with clients who are suicidal, working with clients who are contemplating it, working with families who are survivors of suicide. And so tonight I would just like to talk a little bit um, about suicide prevention and suicide recovery and answer any questions that you have. Um, I'm not quite sure like the best way to um, present everything if you guys have questions right out the gate or if you want me to present some information. But um, one statistic that is really important, I think, for us to remember is that for every person who dies by suicide, um, there are 278 individuals annually who think seriously about suicide but do not die. And so um, I think that that really shows that prevention efforts do make a difference and that it's worth it. Um, as far as public perception, there were just a couple of things that I've come across that stood out to me. Um, I think in rural areas, we're starting to move past the point of, you know, there's still that stigma. We are kind of old school in our areas that, you know, oh, you know, can't see a mental health counselor. But I, I really feel like um, we're, we're getting past that. But one thing that um, I found interesting. The American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, they conducted a survey in, in 2018. And it said of, of the people they surveyed, half of them said that seeing a mental health professional is a sign of strength, but many um, also see that getting access to services is very difficult. And um, so I think that that is something that we really can consider in our rural areas. I think services are there. I think that we're doing a better job of getting them out there, but in our different roles, whether it's, you know, on the boards or whatever that we sit on or our professional or our personal roles, what can we do to let people know, hey, there's help, there's services, and let's help get them there. Um, do you have any questions for me? I don't want to just rattle on. <laughs> so, so thank you so very much, uh, Tammy, for sharing that helpful information. I am going to see if we have any um, members who have any questions by seeing uh, a raise of hands. And it looks like I have two. Um, I'll start off with Councillor Vigil, followed by uh, Councillor Hensley. Councillor Vigil. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Tamara, thank you for being here to accept this uh, proclamation. And thank you for all the very important work that you do for the Valley. Can you maybe comment a little bit, uh, being in the pandemic now for six months, have, have you seen a, a rise in mental health or um, people with suicidal thoughts and issues and that type of stuff? So um, what, what I'm personally am seeing when we look, one of the biggest risk factors for suicide is when we look at age. And so there's kind of um, two polarities in age. So high risk is ages 15 to 24. And then when we look at people over 75, there's another spike in um, suicides with those two populations. And so when we look at, like in my clinic, I've seen a lot of elderly patients who are really um, struggling with that feeling of isolation. Um, they're not seeing their families like they were. They're, our senior citizen centers have been shut down. They don't have that interaction. And they're just, they're just sad. And um, they're also at that point where they're starting to think, I don't have anything to look forward to. And that's a lot of the comments that I'm hearing in my clinic. And so um, really a lot of what I do is just sit there and have conversations with them and just give them someone to talk to. And so, you know, that would be something to really address is how are we addressing that population and letting them know, hey, you still matter. We haven't forgotten about you. And then of course, with our youth, um, finding ways for them to be socially interactive, that's so important. Um, I think there's two things. I think when we look at youth, we need to address bullying. And then we also need to address like feelings of abandonment and isolation. 
because those are some of the issues associated with that age group. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, Tammy. Up next, we have um, Councillor Hensley, followed by Councillor Daniel, followed by Councillor Carson. Tammy, I just want to thank you. Um, I don't want to say everybody's obviously been touched by suicide, but I know I have. It's touched my life. And um, I, I just think it's great that we keep bringing awareness and that we, like you say, not making it so that every day it's a little less of a taboo or, or that it's something that we can be comfortable with. And so I wanted to thank you for sharing that. I don't mean to put you on the spot. So if you don't have the answer, I understand. But I know there's a phone number that anybody can call. Um, and so if you didn't mind sharing that, I always like to write it down. And um, so if you have it, I would write it down again. I do have that. Let me bring it up. Um, so it is um, 1-844-933-2000. Thank you. And they can also text. So like with our youth, like I can't even get my own kids to talk to me on the phone. I have some teenagers and college kids, but um, they can text 38255. And then of course here in the Valley, we can always call the, the behavioral health crisis line. And that's 589-3671. If you do call that after hours though, it will go to dispatch. So just, you know, be, I guess, just mentally prepared for that. Um, so yeah, those are those are two options that we have. But I so, didn't. Did you say the text was three eight two five? Um, three eight two five five. Yeah. Thank you. I knew I was missing a number there. Thank you. <laughs> uh huh. And it's actually four nine three, not nine nine three. That can be hard to read. Oh. Can you say it again? So one eight four 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 nine three eight two five five. Thank that's you. Okay. No, that's okay. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Hensley. Um, we have Councillor Daniel followed by Councillor Carson. Tammy, I just wanted to say thank you for the work that you're doing in the clinic. Um, and maybe if you could talk to just a little bit about how um, if family members are worried about someone that they care about or um, friends or something like that, what the best first step for them would be. So I think this goes um, you know, just those direct conversations, kind of what was included in the proclamation. And um, so there's the, and I keep, I'm sorry, I'm going back to PowerPoint. That's why I keep bringing things up. I don't know if you guys can see me or not, but um, the, let me find it. So the be the one to, um, and if there's the hashtag be the one, and it's the number one, be the one to, and then that's the website as well. But they have um, like number one, just to ask when someone you know is in pain, um, just ask the tough question. Like, are you thinking about suicide? Um, one thing that I find myself asking a lot is sometimes um, there's a difference between I want to kill myself and I just, you know, just wish I was was dead. And sometimes there's a difference in just that I don't really want to kill myself, but I'm just not happy living and just kind of helping navigate those conversations. And you know what? You're not going to get it in over your head. Um, clinically, like we can study evidence on top of evidence just says that one of the most important things you can do professionally, personally, anything is provide empathy. And so, um, so just ask that question and then just, you know, really be empathizing and understanding um, and then keep them safe. Again, directly ask, do you have a plan? And then if they have a plan, like separate them from anything that they could use to carry out that plan, um, be there. And that's really just that listening with compassion and with empathy and without judgment and then helping them connect. So again, like you guys taking down those numbers, calling the crisis line, you can take them to the walk-in center, um, connect them with a mental health professional, reach out if they have support systems. That's another thing, you know, um, that I, I do, I, you know, we always ask like, well, do you have family that lives with you? Is there someone that you can trust? And just getting them connected with someone that they feel safe with. And then a really important one is to follow up, like check in with them on a regular basis. So um, sometimes we kind of think, well, I, I talked to them, I got them help, they're okay. And then we never follow up. And that, you know, kind of um, it taps into those feelings of abandonment and isolation, which can make it worse. So just always follow up. Okay, 
Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Daniel. Now uh, we'll go down to Councillor Carson. Uh, Tamara, I just wanted to reiterate what everyone, um, thank you for the work you're doing now uh, and, and before um, through this uh, time of crisis that we've had the last few months. Um, it's probably, you know, been an exponential increase. Um, so just uh, thank you and take care of yourself as well. I know if you're hearing, uh, listening to people every day, listening to, to what they're going through, um, that can be really taxing on, on, on a person. So uh, take time for yourself as well and, and you know, your staff and, and just take care of each other. And again, thank you. Um, it's really important work. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Carson. I have a uh, Councilor Hensley followed by Councilor Brawls. Sorry, I didn't take my hand down. Okay, Councilor Brawls. No worries. I just want to say thank you, Tammy, for your good work. Appreciate that. Thank you. Well, Tammy, thank you so very much, and, and thank you for sharing that helpful information and continue to do the good work you're doing throughout our community. Thank you. You're welcome. And council also just like to remind everybody that during these uh, uncertain times, there are a lot of people out there who are going through a lot of different things. So I encourage you all to just be there and, and listen and support whatever way you can and staff the same. Thank you. Okay, so that brings us now um, to uh, consent calendar A. Mayor, I move that we approve consent calendar A. Okay. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Do we have any further discussion? If not, Ms. Martinez, will you please take the vote? Um, Councillor Vigil? Yes. Councillor Hensley? Yes. Councillor Daniel? Yes. Councillor Carson? Yes. Councillor Broyles? Yes. Mayor Coleman? Yes. The motion carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Okay, up next we have um, under regular business, business brought forward by uh, city staff, city manager legal, the first reading of ordinance number 22-2020, uh, adopting the 2020 uh, model traffic code. Thank you, Mayor. The city's traffic ordinances are uh, in embodied in the model traffic code that is published by the Colorado Department of Transportation. And the city does not have to adopt either the model traffic code or the most recent version of the model traffic code, but generally tries to do so. The vast majority of uh, municipalities in the state of Colorado and counties as well have adopted the model traffic code to govern traffic on the on the streets within their jurisdiction and that provides uniformity throughout the state. So earlier this year the Colorado Department of Transportation revised the model traffic code. There really aren't a lot of changes between the 2018 version and the 2020 version. We had earlier adopted the 2018 version. Um, I did include a red line between the two versions if anyone's interested in the materials. Um, also, when, when we adopted the 2018 version, we struck a lot of the traffic code that was not applicable to Alamosa and we added portions specifically relating to parking, bicycles on sidewalks, speed regulation in parking lots that are not in the model traffic code, but that council has determined are necessary um, within the city of Alamosa. So before you is the adoption of the 2020 version of the code um, with pretty much the same deletions and additions that occurred when we adopted the 2018 version. And I just wanna highlight the alternatives um, here just so you're thinking of them. The staff's recommended alternative is that we adopt it with those same additions and deletions as are set forth in the materials. Um, you recently considered Colorado's uh, very recent um, option to cities to allow bicycles to roll stop signs, roll through them without stopping, and had determined not to do that. Uh, I, I don't think there's any reason to revisit that question, but you could if you wanted. Uh, similarly, it, there's been a longer 
available option to allow for off-highway vehicles on city streets, which we have never done. Um, and you, you could consider that, that is certainly not staff's recommendation. Um, those are the really the kind of the two issues to think about when you're thinking about whether you might want to do something different than is proposed in the ordinance as drafted. Thank you, Mr. Suiza. Okay, so um, council, I, I, I don't see any hands up. Okay, uh, Councilor Daniel. Mayor, if there are no questions or anything, I move that we approve ordinance number 22-2020 on first reading and set it for a public hearing on October 7th, 2020 at 7 p.m. or as soon thereafter as the matter may be heard. Second. A second. Okay, we have a motion, we have a second. Do we have any further discussion? Okay, I don't see any hands ra raised. Ms. Martinez, will you please take the vote? Yes, sir. Councillor Broyles? Yes. Councillor Hensley? Yes. Councillor Carson? Yes. Councillor Daniel? Yes. Mayor Coleman? Yes. Councillor Beho? Yes. The motion carried unanimously. Okay, thank you. That brings us to the next item on the agenda, the first reading of ordinance number 23-2020, an ordinance adding a new title four to chapter seven of the code of ordinances of the city of Alamosa to regulate fireworks in the city of Alamosa in the way that mirrors the state code. Who's presenting that? Eric, I believe you're on. I forgot on. to unmute myself. Council, this matter, this matter arose out of an incident uh, not that long ago in the city of Alamosa with some illegal fireworks being set up set off they were written into municipal court and we didn't really have a very good uh, ordinance provision what we used was disturbing the peace because it was done late at night in a way that disturbed the peace but really there are greater public safety concerns with respect to illegal fireworks in the city of alamosa other than just disturbing the peace and a similar um, to some of the abusive 911 calls that we did and things like that. There are many times where it's more appropriate to bring a violation of illegal fireworks in municipal court than it is in state court. It's also quicker and more responsive. So the proposed ordinance will set up a fireworks uh, regulation in municipal code that mirrors the regulation in state code such that uh, the police department can write tickets for illegal and improper use of fireworks into municipal court rather than being limited to writing those into state court. And uh, illegal fireworks that we experience generally tend to be anything that leaves the ground. So uh, that's, that's illegal under state law unless you're a professional, you know, putting on a professional fireworks display and um, it it needs to be prohibited within the city unless you're putting on a professional display. That's what this code would do. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Suizo. Okay, I'll turn it back over to council. What's the penalty? There are no set penalties. So it, it, there is not a violation schedule proposed in the ordinance. It's the any ordinance, as any ordinance violation, it's in the judge's discretion. Uh, the judge, the municipal court is limited to fines of up to $2,650, I think it is. And uh, J this would not be proposed to be a jailable offense. Uh, in my experience, I can tell you the judge rarely fines anybody more than $100 for, uh, for a first violation of any ordinance provision. Okay, well, with that being said, unless there's other questions, Make a motion to be approved ordinance number 23-2020 on first reading and set it for a public hearing on October 7, 2020 at 7 p.m. or as soon thereafter as the matter may be heard. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Yeah, for clarification, you're saying any fireworks that leave the ground, like bottle rockets or how about those whistles that go up five or six feet? Illegal. 
I mean, that's illegal under state code right now. This is just a question of whether you get written up in state court or, or municipal court. No, you're not. You're not. He, he's confused, I think, uh, David. I, I understand what you're asking. No, those aren't illegal. As long as it's planted on the ground, it can shoot in the air. If it's not a projectile, a projectile is, and correct me if I'm wrong, right, Eric? It's got to be something that launches off the ground. If it's got a base, as long as it is uh, not a, a, a projectile, by definition, those are called, state law. Like those fountain fireworks. Yeah, a fountain is not illegal. Right. Yeah. Chief and that, that's kind of, you got go those, You have those whistlers that go, that shoot around, but they go up about five feet and they come back down. Oh, it's like a fountain. That's the same thing. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, Eric. It's uh, anything that leaves the ground is illegal under state statutes. Yeah, as, as long as it's based, it, that's... Yeah. Yeah, fountains are okay. Fountains are yeah. specifically defined as being okay. So that, that would be the same thing, Dave. This is bringing it from the state to a municipal. Uh, right. It, yeah, it just brings it in line to where there's a way to deal with the people that go to New Mexico or Wyoming and pick up the the mortars, as they're called, or whatever, that launch them. And they're leaving the ground right now. There's really not a good foothold on how to deal with that, even though they are illegal in the state of Colorado. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you. I, I believe we have a motion. We have a second. If we have no further discussion, Ms. Martinez, will you take the uh, vote, please? Yes, sir. Councilor Daniel? Yes. Councilor Vigil? Yes. Councilor Carson? Yes. Councilor Broyles? Yes. Councilor Hensley? Yes. Mayor Coleman? Yes. The motion carried unanimously. Okay, thank you. That brings us down to the next item on our agenda, uh, committee reports. Uh, Council, if you have any committee reports, please raise your hand and I will recognize you. Up first, we have Councilor Hensley. Councilor Hensley. All righty. So I had a couple of committees um, that I went to. Um, the first one actually was today. I was um, at the tree board and obviously uh, we had a lot of tree activity. <laughs> um, but really that didn't come up much in our discussion today. Uh, but one thing I had a question, um, I missed the meeting that was, I believe the end of June or beginning of July. I'm, I'm assuming it was the beginning of July because um, I was out of town and I know the tree board made a presentation and I think Councillor Carson. You muted yourself, Councillor Hensley, you muted yourself. Sorry, um, I, my computer's being extra sensitive tonight. Um, and so I'm looking at my notes as I'm talking, and I guess uh, that idea of utilities having some sort of policy um, when utilities are trimming the trees, things like that. So they did some research on this and have found that from what they could see, there really has not been any um, negative effects or anything that they are being very careful that the utilities actually hire um, a company that is very well respected to trim the trees where it's needed. And the couple of times where it might appear that it has been overly done, it was this situation where the tree is not probably in a place where it should be. It got planted so long ago, nobody foresaw that it would cause an issue. So I wanted to bring it back because at this point, I think the tree board's not going to go any further with the idea of a policy unless there's some real strong feelings. And, and Mayor, if I could, so Councillor Hensley, usually how this works and, and I can um, group, regroup with, with Andy is when we've got um, kind of a question that's put to an advisory board from city council, they'll, tell, they'll do discussions, they'll research, whatever kind of is prompted. Um, but then we would usually talk to make sure that we thought all of the questions had been answered that, that were raised. And kind of then provide that. So I, if it's okay, would it be possible for Andy and I to regroup and, and take a look at what that research was and I'll refresh myself on Councillor Carson's um, questions because I think it was more broad than just that. Um, sounds, sounds good. And I was at a little bit of disadvantage because it was a meeting I missed. So perfect. Thank yeah. you. And then um, I was at marketing board, I think it was last week. 
And so, gosh, I, I'll tell you, it's a great group because they really continue to do different things, um, even in the face of adversity. But there was, again, some great news that I thought I would share. Um, so I guess I'll start with maybe this, the downside of it is taxes right now for um, the marketing board are down 34%. Um, so it's definitely some challenges. The nice thing is, though, there has been reserves. Uh, the board has been very uh, careful with the money and making sure to have those reserves. So I think we're still in a very good place. And it's optimistic that things will start getting better because um, hotels are actually doing really well right now. And um, in talking to a few of the hotel owners, they actually felt that this Labor Day was a busier Labor Day than previous, or Labor Day weekend, busier than previous ones. Um, part of it is Normally on Labor Day weekend, people come for the weekend and then obviously leave Monday. Um, people this time were actually extending their trips and stayed longer. And um, part of it, probably a lot of uh, kids doing online education, things like that. So a lot of stretch out. So they were actually busier for a lot longer of the Labor Day weekend, which is great news. Uh, sand dunes, even with no water, um, obviously the, the river and stuff has dried up and everything. Uh, the sand dunes was up 20% when you compare August 20 to August 19. And so anyway, so in that sense, sort of that idea of what we offer here in the Valley and in Alamosa is being very well received during this time when travel has a lot of limitations. So anyway, that's what I have to share. Thank you so very much, Councillor Hensley, for sharing that information with us. Okay, I don't see any other hands raised uh, for committee reports. So I will move on down the agenda to staff announcements. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Andy does have a quick announcement and I have a few after him. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Good to mm -hmm. see everybody. We'll speak in the trees. Um, you know, we've been assessing damage throughout the city and, and the parks didn't do too bad, but with the trails and the levees, we're still kind of clearing a lot of stuff. But I wanted to share with you uh, a positive um, event that I, that I was a part of and that was over at the golf course with a community cleanup over there. John and his, uh, his staff, you might've saw this in the paper, they around 60 people showed up with trailers and trucks and gloves and many non-golfers. And I'll tell you what, by lunchtime, it kind of looked like a park in places. It was um, just wonderful. And it, it was just another microcosm of the strong sense of community we have here. And, um, you know, it, it was, I was very proud of it and um, you all should be too. And, they did a great job. There's still a lot of work to do over there with all the trees there. But um, anyway, I just wanted to share that with you quickly. Thank you so much, Andy. Mayor, um, I just wanted to share a few things with council. Um, a reminder for those who can attend, I, I know it's in the middle of the day, um, but due to COVID and, and just some other um, changes, our art festivals greatly reduced this year. Um, we're not even doing the reception that we would normally do for artists. However, we do wanna do a group picture outdoors with masks and all of that stuff, but it will be on this Friday at 2.30 and I believe it's at the depot. You should have received both an email and invitation from Jasmine. And so we're hoping to have as many of the artists who can stay as possible, as well as our amazing street crew. Um, Cause honestly, <laughs> that's one of the biggest selling points we hear from the artist is they're always just so amazed at how helpful and, and professional our, our streets crews are for installation, as well as Jasmine, who's worked very hard um, to, to come into this position new and make sure that we still get these new art pieces. And so we're extending this invitation for the group picture for city council, as well as our art committee as well. So for those of you who can attend, it is this Friday. So um, just a reminder about that. Um, 
Another reminder is we are having our public budget meeting um, next Wednesday at 6 p.m. It will be through Zoom. We're going to start doing um, promotion if Jasmine already didn't do that this afternoon. It will be um, starting tomorrow um, with a lot of different promotion to try to encourage people to participate. It will be through Zoom. Um, and so again, that's next Wednesday at 6 p.m. and we'll be getting that information out. We already have the draft um, budget posted on the website so people can be reviewing that in advance. So that is a reminder for that. And then um, the last thing I wanted to, to share is probably about a month ago, um, myself, some of the department heads, as well as some of our county partners, were having discussions on when we watch our numbers um, from a positivity rate perspective for COVID and the new, new infections and the hospital stays and all of those types of statistics that are being put out, we were, we were kind of seeming to reach um, a pretty good point. And with that in mind, knowing how close we're also then starting to get to winter time, we were starting our discussions um, kind of behind the scenes of how long do we continue this, um, the unsheltered homeless and, and allowing them to stay camped at other locations. And as you know, if it was a new camp, we weren't allowing it and, they, and that's what the designated campsite was for, but also the designated campsite is from a long-term perspective, the only place in town that is allowed for camping, which means parks along the river, alleyways, other rights away, um, it's not allowed. But because of CDC and, and at the beginning of COVID um, with, with the unknowns plus the high rates that we were seeing, we were following the CDC requirements or recommendations of not breaking up existing camps. with these discussions and with where our statistics were and, and knowing um, we need to probably do something before winter time, we started having those discussions. On September 4th with our homeless task force, we shared the goal of wanting to get then those remaining camps transitioned to the campsite. Um, ironically, it's also kind of the same time when we started to see an uptick in um, public frustration related to some of the campsites and, and, and trash and, and some stuff like that. Um, although we were kind of having some of those discussions sooner. But anyways, um, as we discussed it as a group, um, especially depending on those partners who work with that population more, they helped us better plan out a time frame that would be reasonable. And so we felt since we were going to start discussing this with the unsheltered homeless at the beginning of September, we would give them a month and that there needs to be kind of a date and they need to know that we're serious about it. And so that would be October 1st. And so through our partners and through our community service officers and any of our other staff who are interacting with unsheltered homeless, we are communicating that by October 1st, the only camps that are gonna be allowed are those that are at the campsite, which is designated for this. Um, we're also partnering that if they need assistance in getting their stuff over there, we would be offering um, that kind of assistance. Um, we would also, if there's one or two that for some reason can't make that deadline, but it's a very legitimate reason, or they're two days away from um, getting into housing or something like that, um, we would be working with our partners like Judy through La Puente to be able to validate that that's an, that is a legitimate reason. Um, and, but the rest of the, the population will be needing to get moved. Obviously, we're going to need to monitor how the services are going at the campsite as far as do we have enough porta potties, um, the trash, those types of those type of activities. So I just wanted to make sure you guys were aware that those discussions one are going on um, and that we're, we're having that effort and trying to work on it collectively in the best manner possible. I do anticipate there could be some holdouts um, who, who may not want to move, but that's not going to be an option. And so we would then need to look to enforcement um, if they are refusing to move. And so we'll, we'll 
do it with compassion, um, but it's, it's not a choice. And this is what the campsite was created for was because it's not appropriate to have camping at other locations. And on that high note, I'll leave it there. I don't have anything else to, to add for tonight. Thank you, Ms. Brooke. Appreciate that. Okay, uh, Councilor Daniel, you have your hand up. Yeah. Heather, can I ask a question about that? Um, one of the things that came up as we were looking, that came up at our um, winter task force meeting, like the sub subcommittee about moving people there, and one of the concerns was the capacity of the campground. Has that been assessed? I believe it can hold more than the 80 that they're anticipating okay. right now. It's a huge campground. Now, there's some discussions that the chief and I have been talking about that, that will make um, kind of monitoring the situation easier. And then I, from discussions with Lance today, actually with his work with, with the people using the campsite would work better for them as well, which is designating spots Okay. Um, so then that way it can kind of be a better use of the area, but it can also be if, if we're seeing, if someone's creating an issue, they can see it's over at spot 16 and law enforcement will know where that's at. Okay. Um, those types of things. And so we're continuing to have those discussions and where items line up and make sense. We're, we're working to, to make some of those changes too. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. Thank you, uh, Ms. Brooks. And uh, that'll bring us down to the next item on our agenda, uh, Local Liquor Licensing Authority Actions, uh, Consent Calendar B. Um, so let me see. <clears throat> Ms. Martinez, do you have anything or is this something where council could just go ahead and um, make a motion about consent uh, calendar B. You guys can just make a motion if you want to, unless you want me to talk about it, but it is on consent. So okay. It's for the chamber for their October Brewfest. Right. I'll make a motion that we approve special event permit for the Alamosa County Chamber of Commerce for the October Fest, October Fest drink local SLV as described below. Okay, we have a motion. I'll second. Council okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, looks like I have Councilor V. Hill with his hand up. Maybe he would like to uh, have some further discussion. Councilor Thank V. Mayor. You're welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Um, is there anybody here to speak on, on behalf of this event? I don't believe when it's on consent and for these type of things, we've had people here to speak on it. Okay. The reason I ask that question is because I received a phone call over the week uh, from a concerned citizen um, who and I don't know if we, if we want to open this can of worms, but I said I would bring it up, so I'm going to. Uh, they, add, they, they are- Actually, actually Councillor Vigil, before you bring it up, I guess uh, you're going to want to remove it from the consent calendar. Yeah, because it, it, there's a motion on the floor. This is, this, we can't discuss it at this time. Well, he could, he, could move, he could remove it from the consent calendar. That's not a motion. That's any councillor can remove anything from the consent calendar at any time. So- if he wants to discuss it, you'll need to do that, though. I, I, it's not really a discussion. Just, I just want to. Um, it is. If you're bringing up issues related to the to the topic under consideration, it's discussion. Okay. Can we move that off for discussion, quick, Council? You you can do it, Councilor V Hill. You don't need anyone else's vote to do that. Okay. Then I I want to move it off and just have a quick discussion, and more of like an informational deal for. Some people who might be here tonight on this meeting, uh, I received a phone call and this person was uh, upset uh, about the parades and upset with the rodeo being moved out of town and that, and she was just wanted to make it really clear that um, she is good with this event, but um, that, it, that the, the masks and all the safety protocols need to be really enforced because that's what we were expecting of these other events. So it, it, it better happen with this event. So I just want to communicate to folks all those safety precautions that are in place and that will be upheld according to the agenda item. And if Heather or somebody could speak on that, 
uh, I don't mind doing that either, but just so that we, they, they know what's going on too. Well, and so I can't speak to every single item that's required, um, nor I know they've been working with public health, but what I can speak to is the two major ones, which is masks and um, the 175. So clearly we're going to work with them to make sure that it is spread out, that there's not groups of 175 and they have a plan in place in regards to ensure there's not some kind of group of 175 that would be a little odd for this type of um, event. Um, and that the masks are worn when they are close to the, the beer if they're not drinking it, obviously type of thing. The other thing though I wanna offer out is um, I think sometimes people's interpretations of what they think the discussions were for those other um, events may not be entirely accurate. Um, and so I want to make sure that I make the attempt to provide this accuracy. If um, they are driving by and they see five people without masks and, and try to say that there's not consistency here or, or something like that. Very explicitly, what I shared with the organizers for the rodeo was we don't need 100% compliance. What we need is for them to have a plan that would then anticipate that some people would not be wearing a mask and that they would have a plan in place that for those individuals refusing to wear a mask, they had a way to handle it. As staff, we would look at the event and if it looked like 80% without counting, but if it looked like 80% of them had masks, we would see that as a reasonable attempt to get compliance and, and to not have an event where there's, there's no one wearing masks. My impression is without that, um, just doing reminders over the intercom or asking people as they come in was not enough. And I think that proved accurate um, because it, when it was moved to the county, making those attempts, there was still a majority of individuals not wearing masks. And that's what would have happened here at our stadium. And so it has never been 100% everyone had to ma have a mask on and we weren't gonna have staff there counting it and heavily policing it. It was that we needed plans to be in place to have the enforcement from the organizers and we recognize that there may be health conditions. We recognize that some people might have been eating or drinking and not have a mask on at that time. And we recognize that there might have been kids under the age of 10. So again, it's not as if our communication with the previous events was that there had to be everyone 100% compliant with the mask. The other part obviously was the 175 limit, which the organizers had all of that planned out. And they, they had the sections where they were gonna have the limited to 175 with social distancing. So um, I just wanna make sure that is clear um, <coughs> on what those expectations were for the other events and that our expectations are the same for this. And to be honest, we've been working with the organizers who've done a great job for the Veterans Parade which I would expect because they've done them before. They've gotten their application in in a timely manner. We're gonna be able to get it to CDOT for review. They're working with public health and thinking through um, both the mask and the 175 and, and kind of how they're gonna meet that criteria. And it's probably something that is gonna be able to come together and happen. And so it's, it's you know, there's a little creativity and being aware of what those major things are, but with enough time and planning, um, it'll, it will be good. So I just want to share that as well. Thank you, Heather, for clearing that up again. And I just want to reiterate that this person was someone who wanted to make sure we're holding those same standards for every event. And I said, absolutely. So I'm, I'm glad that we're clearing that up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Vigil. So, um, Mr. Suizo, do we have to open it back up for a motion and a second again? Yes, because you're no longer on consent calendar, so it would be a motion to approve the special event permit. Thank you so much. Hey, Council. I'll make a motion that we approve the special event permit. Second. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Since I don't see any hands raised, Ms. Martinez, will you please take the vote? <coughs> yes, sir. Councilor Daniel? 
Yes. Mayor Coleman? Yes. Councillor Vigil? Yes. Councillor Broyles? Yes. Councillor Carson? Yes. Councillor Hensley? Yes. The motion carried unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Martinez. Okay, that brings us down to the last item on our agenda tonight, and that's council comments. If you have any comments, please raise your hand and I will recognize you at this time. Okay, we have Councillor Daniel followed by Councillor Brawls. Go ahead, Councillor Daniel. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to the whole entire city staff who's been cleaning up trees. They cleaned up snow. Oh my gosh, the work that has been happening um, because of our September snowstorm was amazing. So thank you team for that. I really appreciate all of the hard work going into that. Um, the other thing is you may have seen this in the paper, but just want to remind everyone that there is free COVID testing for the community at Adams State this Saturday and Sunday. People can pre-register uh, by going to the adams.edu website and there's a COVID link right on the main page. They also can show up on Saturday and Sunday without um, signing up or doing the pre-registration process. So they can just show up that day as well. Um, and the police department is going to help manage traffic and ensure that people are safe um, getting into the parking lot and getting into the testing. So thank you, Chief, for that. Um, I know that has been really appreciated and the whole collaboration and coordination between Adams State and the city and the county and um, partners has been really, really strong. So thank you for ensuring this can happen in our community. I think there are lots of people who would just feel better if they, they got tested and then we can also use it for surveillance testing in the future if needed. So um, really, really do appreciate that. And so thank you, team. Thank you, Councillor Daniel. Okay, up next we have Councillor Brawls followed by Councillor Vigil. In light of you know, all the national issues, I just wanted to thank our police department again, the fine work that they do, and also our fire department. Our fire department is mostly uh, just volunteers. And they, you know, we've had some people on there for 20 years. And I, I think that's extraordinary service. And I want to thank uh, Chief uh, Chapman and all his volunteers. They do a great job. And I, I just want to extend the appreciation. I think Alamosa community is doing a great job, both in the police, the police force, as well with their fire department. So, so thank you. Thank you, Councilor Burles. That brings us to Councilor Vio. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Ms. Daniel stole all, all my points, uh, but just to reiterate, I uh, want to thank our community for the, commu the cleanup and our response to some of the some homeless folks and people who didn't have power. A lot of uh, groups stepped up, the middle school, uh, the Methodist Church stepped up to help these folks. That was huge. And then a lot of us on council stepped up to do a lot of things. I know some of us cleaned up uh, our neighbors tree limbs and shoveled snow and, and some of y'all went and uh, hung out with people who were without power or without a home or a tent. So just kudos to everybody in Alamosa to step up and helping their neighbors get through that tough week. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Vigil. Okay, I don't see any other hands raised. So if not, I'll just wrap it up. I too would like to and thank the entire staff for your response uh, to the snow and the snowstorm. And also I would like to thank our entire Alamosa community for all of the help that you provided with uh, the trees and the branches and the cleanup. Thank you so much. We have a wonderful community and I'm very thankful and blessed to be a part of it. Thank you all. I don't see any other hands raised, so I will officially adjourn this meeting. Thank you, everyone. Take care, stay safe. Don't let anybody steal your joy. Goodbye. Goodbye. Before eight o'clock. <laughs> <laughs>